Welcome back to Amplified. Now, what if I told you that racism wasn't originally weaved into the American fabric? It's hard to believe that the racial divide that persists today wasn't always ubiquitous. In fact, it was the colonial elites who were responsible for crafting and stoking this division when they arrived in the, quote, new world. Rich white people have been pitting their poor against people of color ever since. It seems we've made progress since the early days of the settlers, but from where I'm sitting, I can't say that it's nearly enough. So just how much headway has our society made on the race front? To help me suss out the answer, we have tapped longtime writer, activist, and anti-racist advocate Tim Wise. I gotta tell you guys, I am so excited to have Tim on Amplified tonight. I am such a, a fan and an admirer of his work. He's amassed 25 years of experience as a lecturer and educator on racism and how to dismantle it. Welcome to Amplified, Tim. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So, I want to start off um, asking you to offer some context here with a brief explanation of the history of how colonials constructed racial divisions from which racial resentment was ultimately born. I recently uh, read your post in Medium, The Problem Isn't White People, It's Whiteness People, in which you lay this out so plainly. So can you talk to us about how the settlers set our society up for racial clashes? Sure. Um, well, first, I think it's important, and particularly in this moment when the right is insistent on pushing back on what they're referring to as critical race theory, what the rest of us just call accurate history and truth, um, and on in you know on their part saying that racism you know isn't something that was baked into our country from the start. Well, uh, it, it wasn't. If you go back to the colonial period, now by the time we got to the founding of the country, it was there. And I'll get to that in a second. But but speaking to your question, uh, you know, when the colonies begin, uh, we know, of course, that uh, the vast majority of of indentured persons uh, who were African worked side by side with indentured Europeans. This is before chattel slavery was firmly entrenched. So early on, at the very beginning, uh, and some historians would you know argue differently on this, but. Some were enslaved as what we would consider truly enslaved. Others were indentured as were other quote unquote white people, not called that yet. Uh, it's only in the mid 1600s that we begin to see the permanence of enslavement for African peoples. And that's also the same period when the term white starts to get used to describe European peoples who were landless and who were peasants. That wasn't the term in Europe. There were no white people in England. There were no white people in Ireland. There were no white people in, in Italy or France or any of those countries, there were just different Europeans or different whatever their country happened to be. It's only in the colonies that the elite decide that they are going to create that term. Now that begs the question, why? Why did they do that? Did, was there some new archeological discovery that linked us all together in one chain of European mutuality? No. Was there some linguistic discovery? No. What was discovered was that the rich in Virginia in particular, uh, but also other colonies looked around and they did the math. And what the math told them was, mm. you take all these black folks who we have now enslaved, and you add to that these poor landless European peasants, they outnumber us like 10 to one, 15 to one, 20 to one, because we got a handful of people run all this land and have all this property and all this power. We better figure out a way to split them from one another because there were rebellions that these poor people would engage in where you had landless Europeans and landless black folks, African folk, uh, joining to overthrow aristocracy in places like Virginia Bacon's Rebellion 1676. So after that, right, mm, you have mm -hmm. a need certain things to create whiteness and to give white people certain perks, certain advantages. So they get rid of indentured mm. servants. They, they allow European peoples who are poor to, to own land, not much, just a little, and of course only the men, so it certainly wasn't universal. But the idea is you start right. rolling out these privileges and these advantages, and then what happens? Those rebellions stopped because these European peasants started thinking they were on the same team as the rich, and by the time we get to the Civil War, you have the elite in the South getting all these poor white folk to go do their fighting for them and do their dying while they sit back on the back porch drinking a mint julep and uh, having black folks do all the hard work <laughs> and they send the poor white people out to, to get shot at. Uh, so it's a trick that has worked. It has worked for 400 years. 
Uh, it's the trick that Donald Trump tried. Uh, you know, he opened up the playbook. I was just going to say, it's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's the uh, old, as, as, it's, you're, as you're describing all of this, I'm, I'm seeing Trumpism play out right, right in front of us. And I, I wonder, you know, you've been looking at all these trends over the years. You've been talking about this um, for some time and studying and teaching it. I wonder what is your assessment about, you know, the way that racism is being used as a manipulation tactic ongoing? Have we made any headway in our society? Has anything changed? Well, I mean, it would be it would be disrespectful to the memories of those who fought and died to change things as much as have been changed to deny that there have been impressive and important victories. Even those of us who come out of the critical race theory tradition, contrary to the to the caricature of that tradition, we all acknowledge the victories of the civil rights movement, the victories of the abolition struggle. Those are real victories. But what critical race theorists ask us is, why is it that in spite of those victories, in spite of those really important accomplishments, we still have such vast inequity. Why do we still have the median white wealth 10 to 15 times larger than the median black wealth? Why is it that black folks with a college degree are still almost twice as likely as whites with a degree to be unemployed even when they majored in the same things? Why do we continue to have the disparities in every area of well-being from health to education to poverty to the justice system to housing? When we've had all those victories, those inequities should have shrunk. Critical race theory says, well, the reason is that we have had a much more embedded system of white domination than some would, would want us to believe. And so merely passing laws doesn't change the inertia. It's like Newton's first law of motion, right, which is the law of inertia. An object in motion tends to remain in motion. Mm. That's true of history as well. Mm -hmm. So when you have hundreds of years where certain people are able to accumulate advantage, the fact that you pass laws that theoretically say you can't discriminate anymore, number one, that doesn't mean there isn't discrimination. I mean, we have laws against murder. People get killed 15 to 20,000 times a year in this country. So laws don't stop mm -hmm. certain bad behavior. But even if they did, the inertia of all that past history is still with us. And so when you don't undo that history, when you don't actually try to rectify that history, it's like having an eight lap race. Certain people are five laps ahead or a certain team is five laps ahead of all the other teams. <laughs> exactly. And they cross the finish line first and they brag about how fast they are. You know, that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Tim, I have one minute left, but before we go, in your latest book, you write, quote, to accept racism is quintessentially American and to rebel against it is human. Be human. What do you mean by this? Well, that larger piece was basically, you know, making the point that um, one of the, you know, the arguments that people on the right will make is that those of us who are fighting racism are un-American. Uh, well, that's not really true. What we are is we're against the history and the tradition of American white supremacy and racism. The reality is that Americanism has too often, particularly white Americanism, has too often acknowledged racism and then accepted it or denied it altogether and done nothing about it. What I'm suggesting is we don't need people to be more like that. We need people to step into their humanity, to recognize that this thing here, this skin color that has given those of us who are white so many advantages, uh, is a lie. It was a lie created for a very specific reason, and it is now hurting everyone. It is what is keeping us divided, keeping us from getting working, uh, uh, livable wages for everyone, good health care for everyone, good schools for everyone, being able to get our head around the pandemic is also made more difficult by racism because early on we saw black folks doing the dying disproportionately. And as a result, what do we do? Mm -hmm. we, we, we took our foot off the brake and didn't figure out how to stop it because, oh, it's those people over there. You know, they're the ones who were dying. And now it's all these folks in Trump country. See, when you when you don't take care of yeah. the whole, everybody suffers. And so we need to be human principally. And that means those of us who are white have to rebel against the perks of whiteness because they come with a cost and we're seeing mm. that cost right now. Wow, Tim Wise, I wish we could all just sit and take your class. Renowned anti-racist advocate, writer and educator, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us on Amplified. Really appreciate having you.